Bom dia a todas e a todos, eminentes magistrados, juristas, colegas, amigos e todos que nos acompanham no mundo todo. Eu tenho o privilégio maravilhoso e a honra de estar aqui para apresentar junto com meus colegas aqui na mesa e a minha colega professora Denise Antolini, o início do programa deste segmento judicial do alto nível do segundo Congresso Mundial de Direito Ambiental da UICN. Eu agradeço a todos os magistrados aqui do Tribunal de Justiça do Rio de Janeiro por nos acolherem e por nos recepcionarem muito bem. Ah, nos sentimos em casa aqui, nos agradecemos muito, como sempre, todo o apoio de todos. Há 29 anos, o mundo se reuniu aqui no Rio de Janeiro e aqui nasceu os novos plataformas, os tratados internacionais, para negociar o futuro do nosso planeta e o futuro da biodiversidade e do clima. As convenções das mudanças climáticas da biodiversidade, da desertificação e a declaração do Rio de 92, se referiram aos direitos e interesses das futuras gerações, os direitos intergeracionais. Eu mesmo tinha oito anos de idade e eu me lembro do acontecimento da Cúpula da Terra, e eu me imaginei, na época, que eu era da geração a qual se referiram. Quase 30 anos depois, já surgiu outra geração, que agora se encontra preocupada não somente com a crise ambiental, das mudanças climáticas, da poluição e da perda da biodiversidade, mas também se preocupa com a morosidade da resposta da geração agora em poder. Quando falamos do tema de hoje e amanhã do nosso congresso, a visão é para o futuro. O papel do judiciário quanto às mudanças climáticas para esta década, 2030 e além. Esta década é a oportunidade nossa de fazer uma diferença para a nova geração e para a geração vindoura. Nos últimos meses... Eu quero colocar em contexto esse congresso com o que se realizou em 2021. Se realizaram vários outros segmentos deste segundo Congresso Mundial de Direito Ambiental, com temas sobre a biodiversidade, a água, o clima, o ambiente marítimo em diversas regiões do mundo. E esta agora, hoje, é a vez do judiciário. O público global enfrentando aos atrasos políticos em lidar com os problemas ambientais se torna ao judiciário para a reivindicação dos seus direitos. No Estado de Direito, o mandato do judiciário é de zelar pelos interesses públicos. E isso torna a reação pública de recorrer à justiça algo natural. A maioria das constituições do mundo reconhece ao direito humano ao meio ambiente, como a Constituição do Brasil e recentemente o Conselho de Direitos Humanos da ONU também reconheceu esse direito. Sabemos todos que não pode haver o gozo dos direitos nem a resolução dos conflitos quanto aos direitos sem a atuação do Judiciário. Verdadeiramente, o mundo e o nosso futuro está em suas mãos. Nós ouviremos hoje e amanhã de vários painéis com magistrados eminentes sobre uma cornucópia de tópicos importantes, começando justamente hoje com as mudanças climáticas. Nós ouviremos sobre essa interligação do judiciário e como o judiciário realmente pode efetuar e se organizar para garantir os direitos humanos ao meio ambiente frente às dificuldades e frente à crise, à emergência do clima. Eu me lembro muito bem, há cinco anos eu sentei nessa mesma mesa durante o primeiro congresso mundial de direito ambiental da UICN e eu admito, nesses últimos cinco anos, 
e principalmente nos últimos dois anos, na resposta, na resposta global à pandemia, eu admito, não me deixa muito otimista na possibilidade de enfrentar os grandes desafios globais na nossa era. Então, eu espero aqui, durante esse dia, hoje e amanhã, que nós possamos tomar alguns passos com esperança para realmente formar uma agenda para o judiciário com ideias que vão de valer para esta década, até 2030. Então, eu agradeço muito a, a participação de todos os senhores e senhoras aqui, todos os magistrados que vão nos falar, e eu espero que possa ser um dia frutífero de debates ah, importantes para o nosso futuro, não somente para a minha geração, para outras que vêm no futuro. Muito obrigado e passo a palavra agora de volta. Thank you, Nick. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. My name is Denise Antolini. I'm a professor at the William S. Richardson School of Law at the University of Hawaii, where you were all invited to visit. <laughs> um, I wanted to speak about three underlying, what I would call architectural themes for the program that started yesterday, will continue, of course, today and tomorrow, and also started with the General Assembly of the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment yesterday. As you know, the title of this Congress is 2030 and Beyond. <laughs> So these architectural themes, I think, for me, underlie the structure, although they're not the topic of any particular panel. The first one is about ins building institutions. So it's so gratifying to see the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment coming to life in such a dramatic way at our third general assembly at the third general assembly on Wednesday, with a lot of help from people in this room and who are also connected virtually. So why do we build institutions? Not for ourselves, right? Particularly this one where it's all volunteer work and it's a lot of, um, a lot of commitment on top of very busy judicial lives. <laughs> um, so it's truly a labor of love. We build institutions for the future. And for me, that fits very well with the theme of this conference. We want the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment the World Commission on Environmental Law and all of our partners, we want them to last for a long time and to be durable. We must build them very carefully and in a way that allows for succession. <laughs> that, so my, my second topic there is for all of our institutional work um, and all of our, I guess, personal longevity. In 2030, a lot of us will be doing something different. And we need to work on our succession plans and bring in younger um, successors into our institutions. The other great advantage of building durable institutions is now GGIE, as has WCL for years, can become a legal personality at an international level in a way it could not before. I'll give an example. So Antonio, I'm going to talk about when Antonio, Marcos Livio Gomez, and Justice Mike Wilson and I and others went to Glasgow to COP26. I brought you the water bottle to prove it. And I remember, Antonio, we were in a meeting, a big plenary meeting with the presidency of the COP with Alok Sharma. And Antonio said, there are no judges here besides us. There are 38,000 delegates to the COP26, but no other judges besides the three of them. That has to change. And with strong institutions, that will change in the future. My next topic, real quick, is opportunities for academic partnerships. You have strong academic institutions in all of your areas, and they are be going to be fantastic partners as we move forward. I want to mention in Hawaii, along with Justice Mike Wilson, we've been working uh, very hard for several years to help create and build the environmental court in Hawaii, the second environmental court in the United States. And one example is we recently completed a project creating the first bench book for the environmental court. So those kinds of academic institutional partnerships will endure and are again an underlying theme of this whole conference because our students, some of whom are here, will succeed us in these leadership roles. Lastly, the other enduring theme I think is judicial independence and judicial bravery. 
and without brave and independent judges, um, well, we might as well not be here. And so uh, compliments to all of you. And I wanted to mention in closing, in particular, a very important case in Hawaii that was recently decided by the United States Supreme Court. We don't have many decisions from Hawaii that end up the United States Supreme Court, but Judge Susan Oki Mulway, who some of you met in Hawaii recently, our district court judge there, had a case involving the Federal Clean Water Act where she ruled in favor of the plaintiffs who were complaining about discharges of water from a sewage well. It went to the Ninth Circuit, all the way to the Supreme Court. Now imagine our United States Supreme Court ruling in favor of the environment, but Justice Breyer found the majority and did. It was an extraordinary thing, but only because of her bravery in the initial ruling and the ruling on remand can we have hope like that. So. In closing, I know uh, we have many exciting panels coming, but there are so many institutional, and I would say, again, architectural themes that underline our work here and that give us great hope for the future. You will hear from Nick and myself at the end of the program, but we wanted to give you a flavor of what's coming. So thank you very much. Bom dia a todos. Uh, bom, inicialmente gostaria de dizer ao nosso coordenador Nick, fiquei impressionado com o seu, com o seu, o seu domínio do, do português. Parabéns. Uh, agora nós passaremos então ao, ao, ao primeiro painel, Judges and Climate Change. E eu convidaria então a Jesse Sapana Pradamala para que presida este painel, juntamente com o Lord Justice Keith Lindblom, da Court of Appeal of England and Wales, que o fará por videolink. E também convido o presidente da IAJ, da International Association of Judges, desembargador Igreja Matos, para compor a mesa. Muito obrigado. Muito bom dia a todos. Em nome do Tribunal de Justiça do Estado do Rio de Janeiro, gostaria de saudar a todos os participantes do segundo Congresso Internacional de Direito Ambiental. É uma honra para esta instituição poder sediar debates tão importantes sobre temas candentes do nosso mundo e do nosso meio ambiente. E eu gostaria de passar a palavra ao Dr. José Igreja, que é presidente da Associação Internacional de Juízes e também desembargador da Suprema Corte da região do Porto. Muito bom dia a todos. É de facto uma honra, como já ontem procurei transmitir, estar presente neste Congresso com a dimensão, a qualidade, a excelência que o caracteriza. E, e de facto temos dois, dois palestrantes, eles próprios de referência, e que passaria de imediato a apresentar da Suprema Corte do Nepal, nossa colega, a minha colega, estimada colega, Sapana Pradhan Malá, irá fazer a primeira intervenção. Muito obrigado. Uh, thank you, Justice Silavid. And thank you for introducing me. Uh, today, uh, we have a session on climate change and role of judges. Uh, climate litigation report 2020 have evidenced not only increased number of cases on climate change in the courts, but also number of the countries where jurisdiction has been activated are increasing. Litigation has become a strategic discourse for holding government and private sector uh, accountable in their actions, inactions, insufficient action, and negative action on climate change. Even identified the law and policy gaps, created directives, and helped to enact law, put uh, 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 enact law and put law into a place. Some jurisdiction has also activated sumo to actions. Court have expanded the rights, applied different principles, and expanded the jurisprudence. 
But climate change is persistent, pervasive, and pernicious problem. Therefore, there will be tremendous pressure on judges to handle different nature of the uh, cases. Both the cause and effect of climate change are universal. In order to fight the climate change, strategic litigation and effective remedies are important, not only to respond to damage, but to address the cause for the sustainable peace, understanding of uh, climate uh, change, different principles, economics, policies, science is key. In this session, we have two eminent panelists, Professor Locke uh, Leverson and Professor Nichols uh, Robinson. We, in, uh, we give uh, uh, 15 minutes uh, to the panelists. I would like to introduce our first panelist. Uh, Professor Locke Leverson. Um, I mean, one hand, uh, we have a rich experience of progressive judgment. Other hand, we have many confrontation within the state agencies when judgments are made related to uh, climate change. Professor Locke Leverson will be highlighting how European court has been making difference through the judgment and also sharing some of the confrontations judges are uh, today facing. Um, Professor Luck Leverson. Thank you. I, I'm glad that I can be heard and I hope seen by those who wish to see me. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I will not add to the introductory remarks already made by my colleague, uh, Justice Sapana Pradhan Mala, except, if I may, to make a few scene setting remarks for this morning's session, if that would be convenient. It is, I think, especially fitting that we should be meeting today uh, to discuss issues pertaining to the law as it relates to climate change in many different national jurisdictions. We come together at a moment when environmental law and environmental policy in particular as they bear on climate change, are at the forefront of the world's attention. The agreements made at COP26 may shape the future of the planet. Against this background, it seems highly appropriate that experienced jurists and academics Donc, il semble from different que les jurisdictions juristes and with different legal and judicial perspectives should be meeting to discuss the environmental rule of law and the challenges faced by courts throughout the world in litigation relating to climate change and to the protection of biodiversity. Of course, as the judges among us will remind ourselves, our role as judiciary is very different from that of the policy makers and legislators who gathered recently in Glasgow. The future of the world's climate may depend on the extent to which it is valued and made a priority by them, the policy makers and legislators. We, however, as judges, have a different though still vital part to play in maintaining judicial integrity and judicial independence, in providing equal and fair access to environmental justice, in hearing and determining justiciable claims whose subject matter affects climate change, in explaining and upholding the environmental rule of law, the rule of law that is, as it pertains to the natural and man-made environment. In ensuring that the law as it bears on climate change is properly understood and consistently applied, and in making reasoned and evidence-based decisions on the specific environmental issues we are called upon to decide. Our role as judges is to do justice, fearlessly and without favour. We all have that in common, whichever jurisdiction we work in. Our contribution 
As judges, lies in the power of our reasoned decision-making in every case we hear on the factual and legal issues in that particular case. That is how we are able to make a proper impact on the administrative and institutional processes affecting the environment and its protection and affecting climate change. Upholding the environmental rule of law is, in my view, itself a great endeavour whose success is for us as judges to achieve. I am sure that this morning's proceedings will demonstrate our shared commitment to that endeavour and the strong collegial spirit between us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lord Keith, for uh, introducing uh, the, the session subject and also setting uh, the context. Uh, now, I would like to invite uh, uh, Professor Locke Leverson. Uh, before I give, uh, uh, give um, mic to him, I would like to in, in, introduce him briefly. Uh, Professor Locke Leverson holds PhD in environmental law. He has been Locke Locke at the Belgian Constitutional Court in Brussels. Then he became a state councillor uh, to the Supreme Court Administrative Court, then elevated as a president of Belgian Constitutional Court. He has been visiting professor in different universities on environmental law, and until two months back, he has been director to Center for Environmental and Energy Law. He has also been chief editor of uh, one of the Belgian leading environmental law magazine called Chet Srif Vur Melerist, and also chaired the working group that produced policy for the Belgian Federal Council for the Sustainable Development. He is now a professor. He is also president of EU Forum of Judges for the Environmental Justice and member of the board of the Global Judicial Institute on Environment. Sir, um, uh, Professor Locke Leverson, now uh, the floor is yours. Uh, I invite you to speak. So thank you very much. Uh, can you hear and see me and uh, my slides? Uh, okay, so uh, maybe uh, some years back in time, in 2017, we organized uh, in Oxford uh, during the European Union uh, Forum of Judges Annual Conference, a conference uh, on uh, climate uh, change. And at that time, we saw in Europe a gradual development of climate justice in some European Union member states and at the level of the European Union. But looking at these cases, one could say that uh, those cases were dealing mostly with very specific often quite technical aspects of climate legislation. For example, emission trading uh, system in Europe, some support mechanism for renewable energies or incentives for more sustainable uh, mobility, also around some projects with a major impact on climate uh, or also permits for climate-friendly projects. Some of those cases uh, were uh, also known uh, let's say, uh, across the border, for example, and uh, there was the decision of the Supreme Administrative Court of Austria uh, dealing with the Vienna airport extension, uh, declaring this uh, a contrary to the uh, obligations of uh, Austria in terms of uh, uh, climate uh, mitigation. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, when we hold our have held our conference, uh, this uh, decision had been quashed by the Constitutional Court of Austria. But at that time, there were already some, let's say, more strategic cases uh, introduced. One of those cases was Nature and Youth and Greenpeace Nordic versus the government of Norway. And that case dealt with 13 new oil and gas licenses in new areas of the Arctic Barents uh, Sea. And it is only recently, and uh, of last year, that there came, after first instance appeal, a final decision of the Supreme Court of Norway. Finally, uh, the, uh, the case has been dismissed. 
because the court was of the opinion that future emissions from exported oil are too uncertain to prevent granting uh, of these licenses on uh, the basis uh, of constitutional uh, rights. But as such, the constitutional right was recognized as being, being uh, a legal basis for climate uh, litigation. And of course, there was already the uh, well-known Urgenda case from the Netherlands. Urgenda is a small, relative small foundation, an environmental uh, NGO. And together with nine individuals, uh, it had introduced already in 2013, that's uh, before the Paris Agreement, a civil procedure against the state of the Netherlands. And this case was based on the civil code, more particularly the, the Dutch civil court, uh, uh, based on the fault-based civil liability. And the claim of uh, Urgenda was that the state has acted wrongly and negligently by not taking sufficient measures to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. And they requested an injunction from the court, a reduction of those emissions with 25 to 40% compared with 1990 levels before the end of 2020. And this should be compared with the legal obligation under European law at that moment in which the Netherlands had to reduce uh, its emissions with 16% uh, only uh, towards the end of 2020. And so there was already a judgment of the Tribunal of The Hague uh, uh, in which uh, uh, that uh, court uh, ordered that the state uh, had to reduce its, its emissions with 25% before the end of 2020. That judgment has been uh, criticized in the Netherlands, but also in other uh, countries uh, in Europe. And uh, the critics were mainly based on the argument of the separation of powers. So uh, a lot of scholars were of the opinion that the court was not respecting the separation of powers, were taking, uh, that the court was taking the, the, uh, the seat uh, uh, of uh, the executive or the legislator. And also the scientific foundation was questioned. Why 25% reduction for the Netherlands towards the end of 2020? Uh, what is the scientific basis uh, of that? So the case, uh, uh, the decision has been appealed by the state of the Netherlands, but the Court of Appeal of The Hague in 2018 confirmed uh, the decision, but mainly on another legal basis. And the main legal basis are now the Articles 2 and 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. And it is uh, established case law, also from the European Court of Human Rights, that the state has a positive obligation to protect life of citizens under its jurisdiction on the basis of those uh, provisions. And the Court of Appeal held that uh, uh, that's uh, applicable to all activities, public and non-public, and not certainly also for inherent, inherent dangerous industrial activities. And based on the IPCC reports and uh, the different COPs uh, under the United Nations Framework uh, Convention on Climate Change, the court said we face a dangerous climate change crisis there are serious risks for life and health for current uh, generation of residents of the Netherlands. So the state acted contrary to the duty of diligence by failing to further reduce uh, its uh, emissions. And so the injunction uh, given by uh, the court of first instance has been confirmed. But also now criticism state and um, mainly uh, again on the separation uh, of powers so the case has been appealed to the Supreme Court of the Netherlands, the Hoge Raad. And uh, before the Hoge Raad gave its final uh, verdict, there was a very detailed opinion of two advocates uh, generals uh, of the Supreme Court of the Netherlands uh, uh, going into that uh, argument and uh, arguing 
that the se separation of powers was respected in that case. And so in December 2019, the decision has uh, conf been confirmed uh, again. So the Supreme Court stressed that there is a broad consensus that developed countries should reduce uh, their emissions with 25% by the end of 2020. And uh, the court uh, uh, explained why there was no violation of the separation of powers by imposing a re result-based injunction. Uh, the court held that judges should provide legal protection as an essential element of the democratic rule of law. And uh, let's say uh, this case uh, uh, of Urgenda inspired uh, mainly NGOs in other co European countries also to introduce cases. In Belgium, there was the, so there was the so called Klimaat uh, Zaak, which was introduced by a small NGO together with 11 uh, people who were very well known in the media, together with 55,000 co claimants. And uh, so, uh, uh, and the claim was that the Be Belgian authorities should reduce uh, their emissions with 42 to 48 percent towards 2025, and with 50 to 65 percent towards 2030. The Court of First Instance in Brussels gave uh, its judgment in June this year. Uh, saying climate policies of the four Belgian governments, we have a federal government and, and, and three regional governments, which have uh, responsibilities uh, in that matter. They violated the Articles 2 and 8 uh, of the European Convention on Human Rights uh, in not reducing sufficiently. But, and that's the difference with uh, the Urgenda case, no reduction target was imposed because uh, the court of first instance believed that uh, uh, in imposing such a reduction, uh, they will not respect the separation of powers. And that's the reason why, meanwhile, the uh, environmental NGO uh, uh, has appealed the, the case and the case will go further. We have uh, also uh, cases in Spain in France, we have two important uh, uh, cases. In Ireland, we have the case of Friends of the Irish uh, Environment, where the Supreme Court gave a final judgment in July 2020, last year. Uh, and the Supreme Court held that the National Climate Change Plan is large, largely insufficient, violating Climate Change uh, uh, Act of 2015, and uh, uh, a new plan must be uh, adopted, uh, uh, said uh, the court, uh, uh, and that should ensure that the national transition objective for 2050 uh, uh, will be uh, respected. In France, we have in the first place the Grand uh, de Sainte case. Grand de Sainte is a community, a coastal community. And uh, they brought the case before the Council of State, the Supreme Administrative Court, which gave its decision uh, in November uh, 2020. Uh, the Council of State was of the opinion that uh, this uh, local community has standing because it is particularly uh, vulnerable for the consequences of climate change. Also, the intervention of uh, some NGOs and also other cities uh, like Paris and Grenoble has been uh, uh, accepted. And on the basis on, of French law, uh, more particularly the, the French energy code, together with European Union climate law, read in conformity with the Paris uh, agreement, uh, the Council of State came to the conclusion that France has committed itself to reduce its emissions by 40% uh, towards the end of 2030. But the carbon budget for the period 2015-2018 has in practice not been respected. There is an overshoot. There should be a, a reduction of 2.2% per year. 
And uh, in fact, there was only a reduction of 1% uh, a year. So the next carbon uh, budgets will not be on track. Uh, uh, held uh, the Supreme uh, Court for reaching the 2013 30 uh, objective, uh, which uh, is uh, higher. And, uh, ref uh, and in practice, meanwhile, uh, looking to the IPPC reports and also uh, the new European Green Deal uh, policy, uh, a reduction of 55% for the whole of the European Union towards uh, the end of 2030 is uh, now the objective. Uh, the Supreme Administrative Court had reopened the debate uh, on the requested injunction and gave the government a period of three months uh, to explain how it will reshape its climate uh, change policy towards uh, 2030. And the final uh, decision of the Council of States has been given this year on the 1st of July. And the court held that the refusal of, uh, the, to reduce the emissions uh, is uh, in, view, in view of respecting uh, this obligation uh, uh, must be annulled. And the prime minister has been ordered to take all measures to respect those targets before March uh, uh, 31, 2022. Another case is L'Affaire du Chèque. This had been introduced before the Administrative Tribunal of Paris by four environmental NGOs. That is based uh, on the French Civil Code. More particular, uh, the specific provisions which has been introduced in that code on ecological damage in 2016, and that provides a specific action for claiming uh, re, uh, redress and environmental NGOs can do that under certain uh, 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 conditions. And similarly uh, to uh, the uh, Grand Descent uh, case, uh, also here uh, the tribunal found that, that uh, France, uh, the policies of France are not uh, on uh, track, that the state should comply with its own uh, objective, and uh, there was also a demand uh, for imposing more ambitious uh, objectives. Uh, this had not been followed by the court, but meanwhile, because European Union policies have been uh, reviewed in a more ambitious way, uh, that necessary, uh, never, uh, never, uh, uh, to less. And there was a final uh, judgment in October this year that orders the government to take all necessary measures to repair the ecological damage at the latest uh, end of next uh, year. And the court has quantified the damage still to be repaired at 15 million tons of carbon dioxide uh, equivalent. An important case also in Germany, the case of Neubauer at Allies, a case uh, from the Constitutional uh, Court. So the Constitutional Court held that the climate, the Federal Climate Act of 12 December 2019 is incompatible with fundamental rights because there is a lack of sufficient provisions in that act for further emission redu reductions from 2030 onwards. And referring to Article 28 of the Federal Constitution of Germany and provision on climate action, uh, interpreted in conformity with the Paris Agreement uh, uh, objective, uh, the court uh, held that emission reductions may not be postponed uh, uh, because then large parts of carbon budgets will have been consumed and further generations will be confronted with a radical, reduc uh, radical reduction burden that exposes their lives to a serious loss of freedoms. And the Constitutional Court obliged the legislator to specify the emission reductions post-2030 
to achieve climate neutrality in 2050 uh, and ordered uh, the state of Germany to amend the act uh, the, in, at the latest by uh, the end of next year, which will be happen, happening because it's also provided for in the new coalition uh, agreement of the new government uh, of uh, Germany. Uh, important is also to note that the Constitutional Court recognized uh, the, that uh, natural persons have standing to protect their constitutional rights, but on the other hand, NGOs have no, no standing to act as advocates of uh, nature. We have also cases uh, on the European level. The most important is the are the two pending cases before the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. The first one is the case Duarte Agostinho and others versus Portugal and 33 other states, uh, member states of the Council of uh, 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 Europe. And uh, the, the case the, uh, of Switzerland, Verein Klima Senior in Schweiz. These are two uh, important cases. Uh, so, uh, and uh, the European Court of Human Rights will have to decide in the coming period uh, what to do with those uh, cases. Furthermore, we, there are some big project uh, cases, uh, uh, including uh, the case uh, in uh, the UK uh, concerning uh, the third runway of Heathrow uh, Airport. We have also an important case of the conduct of major uh, companies. So uh, again, the courts of first instance of The Hague, uh, the same who, who had given the first Urgenda judgment has ordered Royal Dutch Shell, so a major player, a multinational, to cut uh, its carbon emissions by 45% by the end of 30 uh, uh, 2030 case, which is also uh, under uh, appeal. So uh, let's conclude. I think looking to those uh, cases, I think uh, some general principles can be deduced from them. Uh, the first one is that the protection of life and health includes also the protection against environmental pollution. That's settled case law also from the European Court of Human Rights. Secondly, human rights constitute a positive obligation to protect against environmental harm, including the harm resulting from climate uh, change. Third, emission cuts must not be postponed to later when only an extremely short time is left for radical transformations. To reduce emissions is obligatory, even if a state's share in global emissions is small. That's an argument uh, which is uh, often put forward. Our contribution to the global uh, warming uh, is small because we are a small country, uh, etc. So the jurisprudence seems to say uh, everyone has to uh, do its fair share uh, in uh, these uh, re emission reductions. Looking at the decades to come, I think national courts will increasingly be confronted with climate uh, change, uh, climate case changes from a different, uh, different nature. I think cases on projects, policies, both public and private, with an uh, impact uh, on uh, climate. Also, I think more and more uh, cases around the necessary uh, adaptation measures. Uh, climate change uh, is happening. Uh, and uh, so adaptation measures, uh, building dikes and so on, uh, are uh, necessary. So also that will give rise, I think, to uh, uh, different uh, cases. Also, uh, the public responses to emergencies uh, will be resulting in cases. We have seen it uh, last uh, summer with uh, the floodings uh, in Germany, in Belgium, uh, partially in the Netherlands. 
Uh, so there are criminal cases ongoing, uh, both in Germany uh, and in Belgium, on the question, uh, has the government acted uh, sufficiently uh, prompt to alert uh, the population uh, uh, to, to evacuate, uh, uh, etc.? Uh, a further question will be, so we have now different judgments saying uh, uh, a state should be uh, do more, uh, but how to enforce those uh, uh, judgments imposing uh, reduction targets. And if a plan is made by the government to uh, to, uh, to try to, to meet these targets, what uh, if uh, the implementation of those plans uh, is not uh, what it should be? Uh, so I think a lot of uh, enforcement uh, cases uh, will come also uh, on. And finally, I think uh, it's very important, I think for Europe, but probably also in other parts of the world, so I mentioned that there are two important, uh, meanwhile, three, because also the Norwegian case has been, meanwhile, uh, brought to the European Court of Human uh, Rights. So uh, will that court bring clarity uh, on the use of Article 2 and 8 of the European Convention of Human Rights in climate uh, cases? So I think that's very, will be a very important uh, judgment if, uh, Professor, uh, sorry, Professor, sorry for interruption because we are going out of time. Could you? Yes, please? this was just my last, my last word. So thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Sorry <laughs> for intervention, uh, Professor Leverson, for uh, sharing your rich experience with European uh, courts, European human rights uh, courts. Uh, this rich experience uh, will really be useful for the lawyers and judges of the world in their litigation strategy. Now, without delay, I would like to invite uh, Professor Nichols, Nicholas A. Robinson, a well-known personality, pillar of environmental justice. Uh, he has been twice elected to, as a chair of IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law, and he is currently Executive Governor of International Council of Environmental Law. Uh, he has written many books on environmental justice and currently teaching and researching uh, with a specific focus on comparative environmental law regarding environmental impact assessment, zoonosis and emerging infectious disease and biodiversity. Uh, Professor uh, Robinson, uh, please, uh, um, it's time to present um, your 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 um, topic, Professor um, Robinson. Thank you very much, uh, Justice Sapana. It's a great honor to be here in uh, virtually in Rio de Janeiro with you all. Uh, it's a, a superb venue for this conference. I've been privileged to speak in this hall, and I'm sorry I'm only uh, able to come this year virtually. But I will speak uh, not so much as uh, my friend Justice uh, uh, Professor Luke Lavrison has about the existing cases, but rather about the law that a court applies and the remedies, in particular the remedies that a court can fashion when a case comes before it. Uh, the cases will come on any number of legal issues, as uh, Lord Justice uh, uh, Keith uh, uh, Lindblom has indicated in his introduction. But once they're there, the remedies uh, that have to be crafted will be, of course, proposed by the lawyers before the court. But the court needs to have a uh, comprehensive view of the remedies appropriate for uh, dealing with climate change, because climate change mm -hmm. is everywhere. It's not mm -hmm. in a narrow confine mm -hmm. of just the litigation uh, that arises. First, I would say any of the enforcement actions 
that you will undertake uh, uh, to deal with climate. So that when you deal with air pollution, uh, uh, abating air pollution uh, as statutes require uh, will help with climate change. Uh, it will reduce greenhouse gas emissions as well as protect the immediate public health of individuals. Secondly, uh, when you deal with water pollution or other kinds of chemical uh, pollution, this is damaging uh, flora and fauna. This is damaging the ecology of an area. And if we are to have photosynthesis work, if we are to have our plants absorb carbon out of the atmosphere uh, and sequester it into the woody pulp of the plants and the roots, we have to have a clean environment. Plants need to have the space for health as well as people having the space, space for health because a healthy plant life is going to make it easier for humans uh, to have more fresh air and, and less uh, climate change. So I would say in your traditional enforcement of environmental law, you are already helping the climate crisis, but there are more specific remedies that also can be fashioned. And I will give you an example. The, every nation in the world, uh, virtually every nation has adopted national legislation requiring the use of environmental impact assessment. Environmental impact assessment, or EIA, uh, is a, a methodology by which an administrative agency or a local authority must evaluate the environmental uh, uh, consequences of the proposed action, both direct and indirect, it must identify options, alternatives to the proposed action that would have less of a severe environmental impact. And then usually uh, it mandates that the governmental authorities select a pathway forward for their project, which has the least harm to the environment, or they can offset that harm somehow by compensating uh, in, in another area of their authority. For instance, if a part of a, a road has to go through a park uh, and somehow that's allowed, then they must expand another park, uh, the territory of another park, to compensate for the loss of the land in the first park. Now, EIA uh, was required in 1992 in the Rio Declaration on Environment and Development. Principle 17 states clearly that every nation, every state shall use environmental impact assessment uh, in its uh, uh, decision making. And this includes the participation of the public, as Rio Principle 10 indicated. But the public has much to contribute to an environmental impact assessment analysis by a, a governmental authority. So the EIA laws exist in every country. In addition to that, EIA is required uh, under international law. Uh, it is a customary requirement of law that a state shall look at the environmental impact of its actions on the territory or the environment of another state. Well, of course, this customary duty, which the International Court of Justice has affirmed, is quite clear. Uh, when you have two adjacent states, we have a treaty, uh, the ESPU Convention on Transboundary Environmental Impact Assessment. But the, the question of uh, applying uh, EIA beyond the transboundary matter is for the global commons. Clearly, uh, in the case of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea in Article 206, this convention uh, states that all, all nations shall use EIA when they do uh, any impact on the marine environment. This means all coastal states have a very important duty to look to protect the marine environment. Now, of course, the marine environment is very important for climate change because it is absorbing 
the largest amount of carbon dioxide into the oceans. And it is affecting the oceans. It's not just a question of sea level rise affecting the coastal states uh, and the storm surges that come with more severe weather. But just as we agree that the EIA must be used to protect the oceans and the marine environment, the other great commons of the world is the atmosphere, the climate itself. The climate does not belong to any one nation. The climate belongs to all parts of the earth. And therefore, each jurisdiction in the earth, each state or territory, has an obligation to protect the climate to the best of its ability, uh, because it depends on the climate. And the adjacent states depend on the same climate, uh, and faraway states depend on the same climate. There is, in fact, a question here of universality, of solidarity, uh, and of the care for what was called 50 years ago during the 1972 Stockholm Conference, our spaceship Earth, our small envelope of life. So what do we do with EIA? What does a judge do when, when they, he confronts or she confronts a case uh, that uh, obviously could have had an environmental impact assessment? Well, the first uh, is not to ignore this obligation. It is to inquire, was an environmental impact assessment done? Uh, and if not, why not? You should go back and do it again. Uh, so EIA will give us the opportunity to look at how to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. And secondly, how to adapt uh, in the terms of the project or activity uh, being proposed uh, to the question of uh, the, the uh, climate. Now with mitigation, this means looking at the alternative ways to consume energy, uh, to reduce the uh, uh, amount of energy used by having more efficient uh, uh, designs uh, and, and so on. Now a court does not have to do that work. The court's duty is to ensure that EIA was done by the uh, governmental authority before the court and to send it back to be done again properly if it was ignored. The second is adaptation. Adaptation uh, means how to build resilience into the project. If we want projects that are going to last beyond 2030, beyond 2050, they will have to withstand more severe weather conditions. They will have to be supportive of the infrastructure around them. They will have to provide a, a way for uh, the projects to have uh, growth and change as technology changes. And this kind of resilience needs to be part of an environmental impact assessment so that the adaptation aspect, adaptation to the new conditions and the changing conditions of climate uh, is part of EIA. Now, <clears throat> the, the remedies for this then are effectively a remand, a send it, sending the case back to the agency with instructions to closely follow the rules of EIA. Uh, and secondly, uh, where EIA was done badly or inadequately, uh, an opportunity to supplement that, that prior EIA. Most uh, national procedures have a way to supplement an earlier EIA in light of changing conditions, in light of updated uh, knowledge. Now, all of this importance of environmental impact assessment uh, may sound technical, but it is in fact the means by which the human right to the environment can be observed. The human right to the environment is, an, is a generalized right, uh, and it must be applied in specific circumstances. And environmental impact assessment is a generalized process it is malleable to all kinds of activities, all kinds of, of projects. And so when we choose to recognize in our national constitutions that most nations provide a right to a healthy environment in their national constitutions, or when we refer to the national legislation for environmental impact assessment, uh, we are in fact applying a universal right to the environment. 
Uh, it's made contextual and national in the context of the uh, jurisdiction where the court is sitting and the laws it must apply. But it is a, a pattern uh, of implementation which is uh, parallel around the world. And that means that the uh, comparative environmental law analysis that was so brilliantly presented just now by Luke Leverson, uh, that becomes a very valuable reference point for courts in every country. Uh, it will be interpreted differently in each country, but it will follow a, a, a congruent pathway forward. Uh, I would suggest also that the jurisprudence that others will be talking about in this symposium and already have, such as the principle in dubio pro natura, uh, can be implemented through environmental impact assessment. Uh, it's, it's, it's necessary since EIA involves all jurisdictions to bring it together. With those suggestions as to the kinds of remedies a court should be uh, looking at or familiar with as it tries to uh, uh, deal with environmental questions before it, I, I will conclude. I wish you all the best in this extraordinary conference, and I congratulate the organizers, uh, and, and uh, I'm grateful to uh, all of the co-sponsors of, of this meeting for having uh, such a successful global gathering. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Nick uh, Robinson, for presenting on time. And I would request both the presenter to be connected uh, through Zoom because uh, we still have some time. And I want uh, one comment from the uh, participants who are physically present here, and maybe one pr comment from the people who are connected with us through the Zoom. Thank you. We have uh, one question from the online chat from uh, Amber Pant, who has a question for Justice Luke Lavrisen. The question is, if there is only 1% reduction of greenhouse gases, what legal measures may be suggested to increase that and reach to 2% reduction of greenhouse gases as targeted in Europe? Uh, for this uh, this question, uh, of course, if you are requested to cut your emissions more quickly than initially planned, then you have to take have to take measures to emit emit less uh, carbon dioxide. This means looking to electricity production, for example, that you have to change. Uh, the the fuel you use for more carbon intensive to less uh, carbon uh, intensive uh, emission. Secondly, you can uh, apply uh, measures like carbon capture uh, storage, but more and more use. So capture the carbon and use it uh, as uh, a, a a product under certain uh, circumstances. You have measures. Uh, on mobility uh, instead of cars uh, which uh, use uh, petrol and uh, you can uh, go for electrification and so on and so on. So that's uh, what, for example, is under discussion now in the European Union. So uh, uh, with the new European Commission, one has adopted the Fit for 55 program this means that the European Union likes to reduce its uh, emissions towards the end of 2030 with 55% uh, compared with the 1990 uh, levels. This has been laid down uh, earlier this year in this, in this new European Union climate law. And now uh, one is discussing on the a full pack package of legal measures in all kinds. Uh, we have also measures on uh, energy efficiency, on uh, buildings and insulation of buildings uh, and so on. So this whole package is, is now under discussion uh, on uh, the European uh, level. But coming back to 
the European uh, 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 case and also to the French cases, there the judges have said because deciding which measures should be taken and as a consequence, which stakeholders have to do uh, uh, this or that and how to, to guarantee uh, social justice uh, in all this, that's a matter of politics. So uh, that's that's the main message, I think, from uh, the Jurgenda case that the Supreme Court of the Netherlands say as a judge based on Articles 2 and 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, we can say you must do more than you're doing now, otherwise you do not uh, respect the positive obligation to protect uh, your people. But what exactly you should do, which measures you should take, uh, which combination, which, which mix, who has to pay for what, etc., that's a political uh, matter. We will not go into that. That's up to the government, uh, to the, the legislator to decide uh, about, uh, about, about uh, uh, this. But that's the way, let's say, in, in the Jurgenda case, and also, uh, uh, I think, in, in the German case, in the French case, that... Uh, the judges try to respect the separation uh, uh, of Power. powers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Leverson. We have one question from uh, Judge Bruno. Please. Hello, good morning. Uh, first, I'd like to thank both of the speakers for the amazing lectures we've uh, heard from them. Uh, and it's actually two questions that I have for Professor Nicholas Robinson, because he mentioned the environmental impact assessment. And first, I'd like to know uh, if this is uh, mandatory only at the federal level or if there's uh, some kind of, of mandatory impact assessment uh, in the, at the state level too. And second, whether or not judges should be allowed to review the conclusion of this assessment. Well, thank you very much, Judge, for those very interesting questions. Generally, uh, the obligation to do EIA under national legislation uh, depends upon the uh, uh, structure of the state so that uh, in a federal state like Brazil or the United States, uh, there is a federal EIA obligation under, under a federal statute. In the US, it's the National Environmental Policy Act. But states also adopt their own uh, state legislation. So if the action, if the lead agency or the principal government authority is a state agency, there must be a state EIA law. But of course, this changes if the right to the environment is invoked, because under the right to the environment, uh, anyone in the world uh, has an expectation that the atmosphere will be protected by the governments uh, around the world. So even if a state does not have EIA uh, legislation, principle 21 of the Rio Declaration, uh, soft law obligation, says you shall do EIA, but the right to the environment says you shall protect the environment. So depending upon the facts of the case and the issues before the court, one could argue that an EIA obligation has become a, a customary law obligation uh, within nations as well as uh, uh, throughout the family of nations. Uh, so, in a narrow way, you must have a statute, uh, an EIA statute. But I think the expansion of remedies uh, is going to require uh, courts to apply the right to the environment uh, in terms of the remedies appropriate for the right to be respected. And those remedies, of course, can include e EIA. 
Uh, in terms of the judicial review of an of an administrative agency, a government agency that has done an impact assessment, I think it's quite traditional for courts uh, to examine whether the government authority uh, properly interpreted the uh, uh, issues before it. And if they find there are major omissions in the analysis, uh, large bodies of fact or science that were ignored, or contra contravailing uh, and competing opinions about that fact that need to be uh, re-evaluated uh, or, or disregarded, then sending the matter back to the agency to do the decision-making again is important. So a court need not substitute itself for the agency but the environmental rule of law, due process of law, requires that the court tell the agency it cannot ignore the law. It, it, it cannot apply the law in, in an inadequate, incomplete, uh, or self-serving way. Uh, so there's a very important role for the court in assessing whether or not an EIA was done well or was not done well. And for comparative environmental law purposes, uh, there are a great many cases around the world on EIA. So I think it will be very instructive for the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment to begin to assemble the cases in which uh, uh, judicial review of an environmental impact assessment uh, uh, has been uh, applied, when it's been applied, and, and the examples of judicial decisions that answer your question because it has come up uh, in many countries all around the world. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Robinson. And also I would like to thank you, Professor um, uh, Leverson. Uh, I'm sorry, the, we are out of time, so I cannot take any further question, but uh, before ending uh, this session, I would like to say yes, uh, as uh, Professor Leverson has mentioned in his presentation, uh, there's a lot of confrontation we judges have been facing in responding climate change. Uh, but recognizing positive obligation by state against climate change by many uh, jurisdictions, we have put ourselves as a new frontier in this battle. And there is a trust, there is expectations, uh, there is a call from the world to engage actively to protect nature and fight uh, against climate change. Uh, now it's time to act uh, with unhindered, inclusive, immediate access to justice. And as uh, Professor Robinson mentioned, keeping in mind remedies that includes environmental impact assessment and mandates to restore damaged ecosystem and building resilience. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, and participating um, actively. Um, thank you uh, to the people who have questioned, especially I would like to thank you, Judge Bruno and, and Dr. Amar Panth uh, for uh, contributing uh, through your comments and questions. Thank you.